Hi there, I'm Nico DeHaan and welcome to Living a Primal Lifestyle, where we explore a return to a more balanced and natural wild world. To recover our natural health and regain our rights and freedoms, and I'm Ellen DeHaan. And we're back, and it's a beautiful day in Durango, Colorado. It is right now about uh, 33 degrees, going to be of a high of 43, a low of 15, and not expecting any snow until the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, we've been, they've been threatening snow a few times, but it didn't materialize. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or Odyssey channel. Hit the follow button, hit the like button, and help our channel grow. And we post also on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can reach us. Yeah, you can reach me at uh, NicoDehan at me.com. Or just leave a comment in the sh uh, below the show notes in either Odyssey or uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or... YouTube, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's it. it. <laughs> yeah. And if you hit the link below the show notes, to, you can maximize, maximize your nutrition with products from Mother Earth Labs. These are the, are the products that we use to maximize uh, our health and supplement our diet. And we look at mainstream news stories about anti-aging, natural health, and history, climate, as well as our freedom, and we do our own analysis. And all the topics for today's show with the videos also are listed below in the description. So uh, we're back. Glad to be back. It's been a couple of weeks now. An eventful couple of weeks. Yeah, we uh, went to Vegas uh, a couple of weeks ago for uh, your last conference. My last national law conference yeah. before I retire, which will occur tomorrow. Yay. <laughs> We've been looking for that for a long time, and uh, <laughs> it's a blessing for sure. Yeah, it was a great experience, and I got to say goodbye and, and in trying to inspire the next generation, and, yeah. and it was all good. Yeah, and then we went back to then Vegas. Then we came home. Yeah, and then we went back. And then we went back. <laughs> uh, because our granddaughter, uh, Emily, was skating with the U.S. skating team for the synchronized skating. And uh, they did really good. Uh, there was 13 teams, I think, right? 12. 12 teams. Mm -hmm. And they came uh, in second. It was the adult, the adult uh, division. Division. Yeah. And, uh, this they, is yeah the second. they got a silver. Yeah, they got this, uh, for the second time in a row. Nationals. Yeah, silver. And, uh, yeah. So in the last three years, they got a gold and then two silver. So that was really cool. Yeah. Plus, it's great to connect with family. And we hadn't seen them uh, six, seven months, something like Since that. Since July. Since July, yeah. Mm -hmm. So quite a while. So that was great. Then we drove back, and here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> so we got happy to be home. And yeah. Back to our routine. Definitely. Yeah. It's nice to be out. Not nice to be in Vegas that much because, boy, was it ever noisy. Noisy and smoky. Yeah, and smoky too. Yeah, and we're, and we're not gamblers, and so we were there on business or and or for family, two different hotels. You know, when you you get a certain amount of sticker shock in Las Vegas when we had our breakfast that cost eighty dollars for eggs and bacon, tea and coffee for two people. Yeah, but uh, you know that's Vegas. You, you yeah, you take the good with the bad. You take your money. They take, <laughs> they your, take money. your money. Regardless, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, today, today's show is kind of uh, one track mind. Uh, we're talking about the vaccines. Uh, well, well, let's back up just for okay. a second here and say that a, a very um, complex paper has been published. And yep. it's a, a series of uh, very well credentialed individuals who were looking at all of the records and all of the studies and trying to put together the numbers and really look at what were the results of the vaccines. Over 300 uh, links to PubMed uh, published documents that they reference. So this is stuff that has been out there in the medical community for the last three years. And the paper was peer reviewed. Was peer reviewed, however, redacted just a couple of days ago. Well, it wasn't uh, redacted. It was retract. They tried to retract it. Did well, they, they succeed? They, it, it says redacted on the paper now. Redacted or retracted? Well. Yeah, redacted is not the same thing. Okay. Well, yeah. whatever. Yeah, the, in other words, a group got together right away and said, oh, no, we can't have this. And, and it's, uh, we, we demand that it be immediately <coughs> retracted. And uh, the reason was because of malinformation, and we know that the documents are all good. Some of these are even Pfizer documents and Moderna mm -hmm. documents. Mm -hmm. So the, the re reason it was taken down, and actually not taken down, it was just scribbled across that it was a 
retracted, you say, I say redacted, whatever. Redacted means you blank out words so that you can't read it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the difference. Well, when I look at the article, it says here, retracted. You're you're absolutely correct, as (laughs) usual. (laughs) It's good to be right. (laughs) Yeah, it's good to be right. Uh, So the uh, article, uh, also, I got this from Dr. Bosworth, uh, who is a uh, medical physician in uh, Tampa, Florida. Florida. And I listen to some of her podcasts because she talks about paleo and uh, about keto and things like that. Mm -hmm. But she's very up on things and she uh, flagged this. And this was published in January of this year. It's called COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Lesson learned from the registrational registrational trials and global vaccination campaign. Yeah, now just to quickly, the backgrounds of some of these people, there are quite a number of authors. There were one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight authors and two uh, overseers. Editors. Editors, yeah. yeah. So we have biology and nutritional epidemiology. We have computer science and AI, biostatistics and epidemiology, immunology and public health research, epidemiology and biostatistics. And this is from all over the world. This is... uh, Yep. D- data science, cardiology, epidemiology, public health, and uh, and then there are quite a number of um, references that you can go to. Over 300. Yeah. That yeah are, that all are, from PubMed. All the papers. Yeah, all the papers are there. That so. are backing, that are giving the yeah. information that backed up the... So it data. starts off to say that our understanding of the coronavirus disease and the mRNA vaccinations and their impact on mortality has evolved substantially since the first vaccines rolled out in December of 2020. Early investigations indicated the potential of these biologicals for preventing Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Infection. Based on their first randomized control trials sponsored by Pfizer uh, and uh, Moderna, Moderna, uh, researchers concluded that there was a noteworthy 95% relative risk reduction in symptomatic COVID-19. The overlapping findings between the two trials prompted the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to allow the use of these vaccinations under the Emergency Use Authorization Act on December 11, 2020, a decision that was followed by early unblinding and cessation of the trials. Yeah. Uh, Prior to the rapid authorization process, no vaccine had been permitted for market release without undergoing a testing period of at least four years. Yeah, the record set by Merck and Company, Inc. Yeah, in in 1967, when they developed the first mumps vaccine. Yeah, Uh, Pfizer's vaccine completed the process in seven months. Previous timeframes for phase three trial testing averaged 10 years. And health departments have stated that 10 to 15 years is the normal timeframe for evaluating vaccine safety. Yeah, with the COVID-19 vaccine, safety was never assessed in a manner commensurated with uh, previously established scientific standards as numerous safety testing and toxicology protocols, typically followed by the FDA, were sidestepped. Previously established 10 to 15 year time frame for clinical evaluation of vaccines was deemed necessary to ensure adequate time for monitoring the development of adverse events such as cancers and autoimmune disorders. And to be expeditious, the coordinators of Pfizer and Moderna trials prioritized symptomatic COVID-19 risk reduction over severe adverse events and mortality concerns. In uh, retrospect, this was a grave misstep. Historical accounts bear witness to instances where vaccines were prematurely in introduced to the market under immense pressure only to reveal disabling or even fatal adverse events later on. Examples include the 1955 contamination of polio vaccines, the instances of Guillain-Barre syndrome observed in flu vaccine recipients in 1976, and the connection between narcolepsy and a specific flu vaccine in 2009. So against this backdrop, it's not surprising that so many medical and public health experts voiced concern over the vaccine's 
bypass the mRNA. Let's just use yeah, that. Yeah, mRNA vaccines bypassing the normal safety pro processes. Uh, concern, concerns about inadequate safety testing extend beyond the usual regulatory approval standards and practices. Although we employ the terms vaccine and vaccination throughout this paper, according to the authors, the mRNA products are also accurately termed gene therapy products because, in essence, this was a case of GTP technology being applied to vaccination. And this was the reason when this first uh, news came out, we kind of were hesitant to have this. Yeah, we were very, well, whenever I hear mRNA and that it gets into your cells and it makes changes, that raised a red flag for me right away. Yeah, and so we discussed it and decided, well, let's wait and see what happens. Yeah, we were waiting, we were waiting for the Johnson & Johnson for the yeah. more traditional. And then we decided not to do that either. Yeah. So this is due to the mRNA product specific mode of action. Synthetic mRNA strands encapsulated within a protective lipid nanoparticle vehicle. They are translated within the cells into a specific protein that subsequently stimulates the immune system against a specific disease. Another accurate label would be prodrugs because these products stimulate the recipient's body to manufacture the target protein. And there were no specific regulations at the time of the rapid approval process. So regulatory agencies quickly, quote, adapted, close quote, the products, generalized the definition of vaccine to accommodate them and then authorized them for the first time ever against a viral disease. However, the rational uh, rationale. The rationale for regulating these products as vaccines and excluding them from the regulatory oversight as GDPs lack both scientific and ethical ju uh, justification. Yeah. And uh, again, that's uh, gene therapy. Yeah, products, I think. Yeah. yeah, due to the gene therapy reclassification as vaccines, none of their components had been thoroughly evaluated for safety. And the main concern is that the mRNA products may transform body cells into viral protein factories that have no off switch. That's the that's the biggest yeah, no that's one of the biggest problems with the spike protein being generated for prolonged periods, causing chronic systemic inflammation and immune dysfunction. Yeah, and I think the uh and, and there's a lot in this paper. We're kind of skipping over this to uh, kind of make sense of it ourselves. We highlighted these things, and that's that's really, really what we're reading. But, you know, you've got to realize that. Page. How long is this? Page? Yeah, it's 38, 40 pages, something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, so this uh, helps your body produce this spike protein, but there's no regulatory uh, there's no mechanism awesome. Awesome. to to stop this. So in some people, this just keeps going and going and going. And my thesis, personal opinion is that the more uh, immune compromised you are, the longer this goes on. And the, and the more impact it could have on your system. Yeah, because I think if you're in relatively good shape, and as we're talking about this, you'll realize that they only tested this against people who were very, very healthy. Yeah, let's keep going. Okay. Um, the Early. Okay, so early in the pandemic, U.S. public health officials promised that the phase three trials would prove the mRNA vaccines were safe and effective, including a reduction in severe disease, hospitalization, and death, and a secondary endpoint of preventing transmission and infection. Nine vaccine manufacturers issued an unprecedented joint statement pledging not to prematurely seek re regulatory review. Both sets of assurances were delivered to a population already suffering from pandemic fatigue, mostly attributable to lockdowns, masking, social distancing, and other restrictions imposed by the same agencies responsible for ushering in the vaccine program. And despite the rhetoric, no large, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials have ever been conducted or if any of them were said they were conducted, they did not demonstrate um, reductions in the transmission, nor the hospitalization, nor right. deaths. In other words, they didn't deliver on their promises. That's for sure. And importantly, the study designs for the pivotal trials 
were never intended to determine whether the mRNA inoculations could help prevent severe disease or premature death. Yeah, this was mainly due to the insufficient statistical power for assessing these outcomes. The power of calculation was based solely on the reduction of the COVID-19 symptoms, the primary outcome. Limitations stemmed from the recruitment of young, healthy trial participants in the 18 to 55 year age group and the relatively low number of reported clinical infection cases in the intervention arms of the trials, with only eight cases in Pfizer and 11 in Moderna. Whereas Pfizer's trials recorded just one instance of severe COVID-19, Moderna's uh, trial reported none, leading the company to proclaim 100% efficiency against efficacy. severe efficacy against, against the se severe disease. And Moderna, Moderna also reported one COVID death in the placebo group. So between the two trials, there was one, only one death attributed to COVID-19 among the more than 73,000 trial participants. So after announcing the trial's results, Pfizer extended its study by four months. Trial participants were unblinded by week 20. In other words, if you got the placebo, you were then told you had not gotten the vaccine, you got the placebo. Yeah, and then also you were... Uh, you had the option of getting the vaccine afterwards. Right. The placebo so, volunteers were invited to receive it. Yeah, and, so uh, Pfizer's announcements of the efficacy of its mRNA product was based on 162 out of 22,000 placebo recipients contracting COVID-19 compared to only 8 out of 22,000 vaccine recipients. 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 So recipients. <laughs> My tongue is twisting already. None of the 162 placebo recipients who contracted the disease died from it. And these numbers are basically too small to draw any meaningful, pragmatic, or broad sweeping conclusions regarding morbidity or mortality. Now, this is the real big part here. Um, a large number of cases identified during the study fell under the category of suspected COVID-19, where individuals exhibited, exhibited symptomatic COVID-19 but lacked positive PCR tests. So PCR. There, was, there was no test that confirmed they had it, and a total of 3,400 in 10 cases of suspected unconfirmed COVID-19 were identified, a 20-fold difference between suspected and confirmed cases. There were 1,594 such cases in the vaccinated group and 1,816 in placebo. And when factoring in both confirmed and suspected cases, vaccine efficacy against developing system symptoms drops to only 19%, which is far below the 50% reduction threshold required for regulatory authorization under ordinary circumstances. Yeah, even when removing cases uh, occurring within seven days of vaccination to account for short-term vaccination re reactogenicity. Yeah. <clears throat> Rather than true infections, efficacy would be a meager 29%. And any false negatives among the suspected cases would tend to further diminish the benefit. Thus, when considering both confirmed and suspected cases, vaccine efficient, effic efficacy appears to have been dramatically lower than the official, quote, 95 percent. Yeah, it's important to emphasize that the cases being counted in the trials were PCR positive patients with mild infections, not moderate or uh, severe illnesses. Thus, a cough or other mild respiratory symptoms qualified as the primary endpoints. The trial's conclusion was predicated on a mere 100 of such cases recorded within the placebo group. Once the trial reached this point, it was, it was anticipated that efficacy would be declared and participants in the placebo group would be offered the active vaccine. And this was what transpired. So, so the, 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 blind, the blinded phase was concluded at two months for Pfizer and Moderna's ended at three, effectively terminating the blind randomized follow-up period and greatly limiting any risk-benefit evaluations. Yeah, the lack of ability to evaluate serious illnesses in trials reflected the real-world content, namely that the likelihood of severe COVID-19 hospitalizations and dying from the infection has always been very low.
Although randomized controlled trials were viewed as the gold standard for testing and safety and efficacy of medical products because they minimize bias, trials of limited scope can readily obscure the true safety and efficacy issues with respect to different segments of the population. Yeah. In this case, the trials excluded key subgroups, notably children, pregnant women, frail elderly persons, and immunocompromised individuals, as well as those with cancer, autoimmune diseases, and other chronic inflammatory conditions. Whereas the founding trials did not recruit individuals with comorbidities, vaccines, comorbidities, yeah. Vaccine uh, recipients in the rollouts showed the active presence of these underlying conditions. Rather than assess these well-known safety and comorbid risk concerns, the focus was narrowly placed on the potential for inflammatory lung injuries, as has been seen in COVID-19 patients and many years, uh, years earlier in immune animal models infected with... Immunized animal models. Infected, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are now beginning to real, uh, recognize the folly of these narrow safety focus as millions of severe and life-threatening events associated with the COVID-19 vaccines continue to be documented in the medical li literature. And the article then refers you to the citations for the medical literature, so you can look on your own. The true mortality impact remains unknown, and that fact alone is is relevant as it would be preferable to take a vaccine with good trial evidence of reduced mortality than to take a vaccine where trial evidence does not show convincing evidence of improved survival. Yeah, similar there is subs oh you wrote that uh, no you go ahead. Oh the similar is subsequent analysis of the Pfizer trial data concluded that mortality rates were comparable between vaccinated and placebo groups during the initial twenty week period of the randomized trial. And the, the fact that the mRNA vaccines did not lead to a reduction in overall mortality implies that if the injections were indeed averting deaths specifically attributable to COVID-19, any such reduction might be offset by an increase in mortality stemming from other causes such as severe adverse events. Even the six-month uh, Pfizer trial failed to show any reduction in all-cause all mortality. Yeah. Regarding potential harms, assuming a 30% false positive report and a moderate underreporting factor of 21, the authors of this paper and the researchers calculate a risk of 27 deaths per 100,000 doses. And this was of the BNT uh, 162B2, which was uh, the Pfizer. Yep. Okay. Thus, applying the reasonable conservatives' assumptions. The estimated harms of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines greatly outweigh the rewards. For every life saved, there were 14 times more deaths caused by the injections, the mRNA injections. Very troubling stuff. They have some graphs in here, of course. Uh, yeah, just comparing various information yeah. and explanation of it. Then it gets down to, despite the low overall death count, it is likely... Well, it says beyond week 20, the rate of deaths in the placebo arm decreased and eventually stabilized by week 30. In contrast, the number of deaths among the BNT162B2 subjects continued to rise at a consistent rate. The reduced rate in the placebo arm is likely the result of the diminishing number of unvaccinated placebo subjects that remained in the trial stemming from that unblinding and vaccination process that was initiated after December 11th so that they then could go on and get the vaccine. So it wasn't a pure trial anymore. So really what this means is that your natural immunity seems to control it a lot more and the likelihood of you dying from the disease itself yeah, the is, is completely very, very low. Whereas if you got the vaccine, it just goes up and up and up yeah. as time goes on. And that's really what it says here in this article. It says, despite the low overall death count in the, t in the trial, it's likely that the general public's perception of the vaccines would have been far less favorable had they known that the mortality rate had continued to increase among the mRNA vaccine uh, vaccinated participants. Yeah. Uh, then, the, you know, 
They also are. Let's go to alarmingly. Yeah, the drawing from Pfizer's six months interim report. Uh, Michaels and colleagues found evidence of a substantial increase in the number of deaths due to cardiovascular events in the vaccinated subjects, and the vaccine manufacturer did not report this. If Pfizer had used the actual death rates in their original application, two additional vaccinated subjects would have been included in the application. The discrepancy was crucial because all vaccinated subject deaths, four of the four, and half of the placebo deaths, two of the four, were cardiac related. Yeah, forensic analysis revealed that 75% of the deaths in vaccinated subjects and 33% of those in placebo group were cardiac related. Among the 14 subjects experiencing cardiac severe adverse events. 11 were individuals who had received the BNT162B2 vaccine. Three were from the placebo-only trial arm, which was a significant increase. And neither the original paper nor Pfizer's summary clinical safety report acknowledged or commented on this crucial safety signal. In hindsight, it says that the previously undisclosed observation that twice as many cardiac deaths occurred proportionately among vaccinated compared to unvaccinated subjects in the Pfizer trial would likely have prompted the FDA reevaluation, especially concerning the latter accumulated date, data by December 10th of 2020. And where 17 deaths had occurred, of course, which were not included in the Pfizer right. report. All right, let's uh, let's try something else here. Yeah, this is this getting is more disturbing very, as we go yeah, down the line. Here. It's a very, uh, uh, according to a retrospective analysis by a number of researchers, the Pfizer trial data showed a significant association between the mortality rate and the time since the injection in both the vaccine and placebo arms. Minimal number of deaths were recorded during the initial eighty days, but a significant mortality increase was observed around the 100-day mark post-injection, indicating a pattern that cannot be con attributed to, to chance. Remarkably irregular trends also are also evident in the cardiac severe adverse uh, events within the trial. Nearly half of all cardiac events manifested within the initial 50 days before the uh, following the. Uh, injection, despite the constant risk exposure anticipated for the first 140 days. Oddly, a dramatic surge in cardiac severe adverse events were observed around the 100-day mark from the first injection in both placebo and vaccination group coinciding, uh, cons coinciding with the high heightened death rate. <clears throat> Let's see, among the trial con now now there was a whistleblower apparently who came forward yep. to uh, raise a number of issues, and among the trial conduct issues that were documented were failure to report protocol deviations, improper storage of vaccines, mislabeling of laboratory specimens, lack of timely follow-up for patients experiencing adverse events, possibly leading to underreporting. And in terms of regulatory oversight, the FDA only inspected nine of the 153 study sites that were involved in the Pfizer trial. Yeah, and it was reported that the, uh, what they were using in the trials was actually changed. Yeah, they didn't and, use the same they, they formula. They used a different formula, and it had much more contamination in it. This year. Participants were not present with clear... Were not presented. Not, not presented with clear information regarding potential adverse events in both trial protocols and consent forms. Some parts of the consent form were misleading and merely intended to elicit, a, elicit participation that might not otherwise have occurred if the volunteers were made aware of what was promised in theory or on paper. Yeah, that was, was unlikely to happen in reality, and as yeah. a result, the the participants were not being granted truly informed consent and the potential injuries and adverse events most likely to be caused by the vaccinations were never revealed, never disclosed. Since 2021, the scientific community has known that the COVID-19 RMNA, RMRNA products do not prevent either transmission nor 
infection. Even experts sponsored by the vaccine industry admitted to a maximum reduction in transmission of 61% in 2021. And then the Omicron subvariants are associated with a 30 to 50% reduction in transmission following the administration of boosters. The benefit was incremental and transient, and the protection against the Omicron infection only lasted a few months. Even though antibody uh, tears, titers. titers against the COVID, uh, SARS CoV 2 are highly or higher following the Injection, the levels declined faster in the mRNA recipients uh, compared, compared to individuals with nat natural infections. Remember that they always told us that natural immunity was not in the picture at all. You know? yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, the impact of the reduced uh, disease severity among COVID-19 vaccinated individuals on the risk of causing secondary infections had never been systematically investigated in the controlled trials at all. Yeah, and then there's some, there's a couple of different things that were looked at, the, the narratives that were told to the public. The first, let's see, what was the first one? The first is that while the mRNA product may not block infections, the products still protect against severe disease, hospitalization, and mortality, and that... And there was no valid there was, evidence. They found no valid evidence whatsoever to substantiate the claim that getting a, a second booster effectively prevented severe illness or mortality. The second narrative was protection associated with the inoculation when combined with natural infection is superior to, so that's your natural, your hybrid immunity. Yeah, which was And bold. then they said, um, the, com uh, let's see, one needs to consider the potential risks of the increased antibody production. In other words, every time you get a shot, you get more stimulation of the antibody, more stimulation of the immune system, more and more creation of... Of the proteins, the uh, yeah, spike protein. Of the spike protein. Yeah, so potential because, overproduction of non-neutralizing antibodies could lead to a phenomenon of vaccine-associated uh, enhanced disease, yeah. which is based in part on antibody-dependent enhancement. There have only been a few reports of mild... Um, vaccine-associated enhanced disease in the animal models, no documented cases in humans. However, with repeated boosters, it's, it's uh, proposed by the authors that it would could eventually impact the long-term safety of mRNA vaccines. In a recent study of nearly 5 million adults, those who have had so, so the uh, okay. infection within 21 days prior to injection... Post post-injection showed an eight-fold increase in asthmatic stroke. Yeah, uh, an increased risk of ischemic, ischemic. ischemic strokes. Yeah, and a five-fold increased risk of hemor hemorrhagic stroke when compared to vaccines without concurrent infection. The risk was highest with those mm -hmm. receiving the mRNA-1273 injections. And uh, the infection close to the time of, va of vaccination produced a strong association with early incidence of ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. Again, with the hybrid immunity approach, the potential harms may outweigh the rewards. That's that risk-reward yeah. um, balance test that they're supposed to be doing on all of these things. Yeah. And it's... Uh, this one, I found this kind of disturbing too here. A large United Kingdom study of over 30,000 healthcare workers having a prior history of infection showed an 84% risk of uh, reduced risk of reinfection and a median protective period of seven months. And that was... Uh, That's without... Without, the, without vaccination. Right. In a largely observational study in Israel, previously infected individuals who remained unvaccinated were six to 13 times less likely to contract the virus compared to those who were vaccinated. Among, among, go ahead. Among 32,000 individuals with the same health, within the same healthcare system, vaccinated individuals had a 27 time higher risk of developing systematic, symptomatic, symptomatic COVID-19 and an eight time higher risk of hospitalization compared to the unvaccinated counterparts. Now that's kind of sad. 
It says, uh, for both the Pfizer and Moderna trials combined, there were about 125 severe adverse events per 100,000 vaccine recipients, which translates into one severe adverse event for every 800 vaccines vaccinated. Because the trials have voted the most frail, frail as participants, one we expect to see a higher proportion of severe events in the population-wide rollouts. So when the, when the severe adverse events were viewed collectively, the risks in the vaccine group were substantially elevated beyond those previously determined by the FDA. Analysis of two large drug safety reporting systems in the United States and Europe revealed over 7.8 million adverse events reported by approximately 1.6 million individuals following COVID-19 vaccinations. Yeah, say that again. It's there's 7.8 million reports from 1.6 million individuals, which means they had quite a number of different adverse events. Yeah. And then when compared to individuals 18 to 64 years of age, the older age groups exhibited a higher frequency of death, hospitalizations, and life-threatening reactions. Yeah, remember so, those people were never in the trial at all, the older people. That's were, right. Yeah. That's right. So, the, the, you know, in an un- independent risk-benefit analysis, BNT162B2 produced 25 times more severe adverse events than the number of case of severe cases prevented. That's an uneven risk-benefit calculus that reinforces the findings, which estimated the total number of U.S. fatalities <clears throat> due to the mRNA vaccines in 2021 alone was 289,789 people. A physician and survey research specialist helped to value it. Uh, validate the survey and the sample obtained by uh, Dyna Data, the, world, mm-hmm. yeah, the world's largest first party data uh, platform, which is based in Connecticut, was deemed representative of the U.S. population. Then the autopsy report. This even gets worse now, yeah. In a comprehensive systematic review with full independent adjudication, 74% of autopsy findings which was 240 out of 325 cases, were judged to have been caused by mRNA products. Yeah, the mean time from injection to death was about 14.3 days. Two weeks. Yeah, and the vast majority of deaths had been the cardiovascular system has a single fatal organ system injury to the body. These findings are reinforced by those of a more recent Uh, autopsy review of the mRNA vaccine-induced myocarditis. And there Uh, were 28 deaths, all of which were attributed directly to the injections. injections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Based on multiple autopsy studies, German pathologists led by the late Arnie Birkenhardt Birkenhardt. Birkenhardt have documented presence of uh, vaccine mRNA produced S protein in the blood vessel walls and brain tissues. Through immunohistopathological staining. Staining with uh, probably methylene blue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These findings help explain the wide range of well-documented COVID-19 vaccine-induced toxicities that impact the nervous gastronomical... Gastrointestinal. Gastrointestinal, hepatic, hepatic. Re- renal, and... Hematological, immune, and reproductive systems. Reproductive systems, boy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this goes well, on. Uh, yeah. The, then they get into the part where they didn't actually use the, the formula that they presented in the trials and that they presented for evaluation. They had a different formula when they rolled out the vaccines for general consumption. Yeah. And there was a, they found in those in the second go round, phase two was there was a presence of simian virus 40 uh, promoter in the in the Pfizer vaccine not in the Moderna and that is a contaminated polio that was also can, contaminated in, in the polio vaccines back right. in the 50s same that's thing that's right and it, it says that an an, on, an oncogenic DNA virus that was originally isolated uh, in 1960, from contaminated polio vaccines, 
induces lymphomas, brain tumors, other malignancies in laboratory animals. Immunological data from cancer patients indicated that their sera, that's the blood serum, had a higher prevalence of antibodies against SV40 compared to healthy subjects. I don't know, you know, it's, it's like, this is the exposure, the expo it seems improbable that SV40 exposure alone results in human malign malignancy, but a more likely scenario is that SV40 functions as a cofactor in the genesis and progression of tumors, in other words, the development and as they grow, as indicated by laboratory studies revealing its co-carcinogenic potential with asbestos and established carcinogen. Yeah, a joint statement offered by the International Expert Advisory Panel sponsored by the World Council for Health included the following. There are multiple completely undeclared genetic sequences in both Moderna and the Pfizer vials with the SV40 sequence found only in the Pfizer vials. However, latent SV40 infections in a significant portion of the population could present the same risk to Moderna recipients. Even in the absence of chromosomal integration, the DNA plasmids, this is what we're saying, that the DNA is now involved with the mRNA. Yeah, they actually found, you know, there was supposed to be a single strand uh, DNA or mm -hmm. RNA. Uh, mRNA is a single strand, mm -hmm. while DNA is a double strand. The but they were actually finding double strands. So they were finding DNA enhancing proteins in the serum that was injected in people that never should have been in there and it was never declared. Even in the absence of chromosomal integration, DNA plasmids could generate mRNA for the S protein toxin and other harmful proteins for prolonged and unpredictable uh, periods of time. Integration of foreign DNA into the human genome disrupts existing natural genetic sequences and it carries further risk of disease. Due to the lack of formal and transparent assessment by the regulators, the experts also noted it is currently impossible to provide informed consent for these products as their complete risks remain undisclosed and are not fully understood. Yeah. The mRNA vaccines offer unique mechanisms of immune activations that are quite distinct from the response to a viral infection. These mechanisms help explain the adverse event profile of these gene-based products. The S, the S protein itself is arguably the most toxic protein produced by the virus. And there's a large growing literature describing the remarkable toxic effects of the S protein. Its, persi its persistence for up to 30 days following vaccination is of great concern. The, it causes, the protein causes an acute inflammatory response, and it has been shown to, in, to induce senescence, meaning death, in endothelial cells and likely contributes to the diverse <clears throat> vascular related adverse events. So, you know, this is, I think we're getting, we yeah, need to getting, move on to another article, but let me, let's go to the conclusion. Well, here it uh, talks about the genetic immune suppression emerging after repeated booster infections poses another major concern. T cells exhaustion uh, refers to an um, emological condition in which the CD8 plus T cell shows a progressive loss of cytokine production, cytokine. Cytokine production and cytotoxic cytokine. potential. So, so in other words, the more boosters you get, the worse it gets for you. Your, your T cells become exhausted from yeah. trying to deal with all of them. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, it's becoming a, an ongoing issue. Let's see what's next here. Given the ongoing genetic changes in the SARS-CoV-2 itself, driven by both natural viral evolution and vaccine-induced selective pressure. We talked about this previously, that, that when you get, that, that these things tend to mutate because they're avoiding getting killed by the immune system. Yeah, especially if you're injected. Yeah. 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 So, so it's uh, so your body's learning to avoid actually the immune response. Yeah, they're calling them the immune escape mutants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, and it says here importantly, immune escape mutants are developing primarily in vaccinated individuals and not in unvaccinated individuals. 
vegetables. Oh boy. Let's and, see. Let's see. You know, this is a long article, like we said. Yeah, let's go to the conclusions. <clears throat> According to the three. Yeah, other... well, you know, it's it's interesting because the World Council for Health is involved in all of this, and they've demanded an immediate moratorium on these novel products due in part to the issue of extensive DNA contamination. And uh, they're talking of it, they mention in here also that it's unethical and unconscionable to administer an experimental vaccine to a child who has a near zero risk of dying from, the, from COVID-19. And, uh, but there's a well-established 2.2% risk of permanent heart damage. So, you know, what the heck? This is an additional risk for these otherwise healthy young individuals includes seizures, cancers, autoimmune disorders, and numerous other life-stealing conditions post-vaccination. Yeah, so later in the article, they talk about the surge in excess mortality among 25 to 54 age group and really associated with the introduction of the vaccine mandates among military and hospitalization personnel from the summer into the fall of 2021. So the mandates themselves now, they have pretty much proven uh, through the surveys from the military group and the hospital uh, workers group that this caused more problems in deaths. Yeah, and, okay, and so in the conclusion, we have the final statements here that says, since early 2021, well, it says many key trial findings were either misreported or omitted entirely from published reports. The usual safety testing protocols and toxicology requirements were bypassed by the FDA and the vaccine manufacturers. Premature termination of trials obviated any unbiased assessment of potential severe adverse events due to the insufficient time frame for a proper trial evaluation. Moreover, the vaccine, the mRNA vaccines produced via process one and evaluated in the trials were not the same products eventually distributed worldwide. All of the mRNA products released to the public were produced via process two and have been shown to have varying degrees of DNA contamination. The failure of regulatory agency authorities to hear, heretofore disclose process related impurities has further increased concerns regarding safety and quality oversight of the vaccine manufacturing process. So since early 2021, excess deaths, cardiac events, strokes, and other severe <clears throat> adverse events have often been wrongly attributed to COVID-19 rather than to the COVID-19 mRNA vaccinations. That's a very important distinction. It was not the disease that caused these problems. It was the vaccinations, according multiple, to this study. Right. So the conclusion here, multiple booster injections appear to cause immune dysfunction, thereby paradoxically contributing to the heightened susceptibility to COVID-19 infections with excessive doses. So the more infection or more injections you get, the more infections you get. Yeah. For the vast majority of adults under the age of 50, perceived benefits of the booster, of the mRNA boosters, are profoundly outweighed by their potentially disabling and life-threatening harms. Potential harms to older adults appear to be excessive as well, given the well-documented severe adverse events and unacceptable harm-to-reward ratio. The authors of this uh, study, and uh, based on their research and all of the papers previously published, they are urging governments to endorse and enforce a global moratorium on the modified mRNA products until all the relevant questions pertaining to causality, residual DNA, and aberrant protein production are answered. And uh, following this is all the uh, sightings to PubMed. There's over 300 of them. The next uh, article that we have in here is called The Biggest Crime in the History of Medicine. That's actually a YouTube video. That's a YouTube video. You can watch that. The next one is a uh, redaction okay. <clears throat> when Dr. Uh, Boz uh, um, indicated that there was going to be a retraction. retraction. Uh, this was written by Dr. McCullough. Well, there was a there were a number of the, when the pay, when the objections were registered. 
by these independent parties who are not medical people or not researchers right. and so on. Uh, it, it, they, their comments actually attack the authors and their conclusions. Yeah, and that's so, all in here. And one of the people who was involved in this study and one of the co-authors, Dr. Peter McCullough, so then the he wrote this. a letter, you yep. know. And he, highlighting what the claims were and his response. Yeah, so and well, and the, the responses were from all of the authors. And, yeah. and, of course, the things that were said were just simply not based in fact or yeah. were misstatements of what was in the original Right, and the next one is another video with uh, Dr. Annette Bosworth. Uh, paper retracted was I duped, and she discusses that. And yeah, the first the first it. video with Dr. Bos was her uh, commentary analysis. on analysis of the entire re report, and, and then she she then reacted to the uh, the, the retraction, retraction, the attempted the, retraction, whatever yeah. that ended up being. And uh, then uh, I think this morning I listened to her and she had a little commentary on that she was uh, demonetized. demonetized on YouTube for those particular videos. And then she was simply reporting what had already been published. Yes. It's, it's very disturbing. And they particularly mentioned that it was of malinformation that even though the articles were true, it made the uh, government, the FDA... The World Health Association, Pfizer, and Moderna look bad. Right. So we can't have that. Thank goodness. Yeah. Okay, okay. so now we go on to funeral director for a finds bizarre rubbery, rubbery clots, blood clots in the bodies of vaccinated individuals. Yeah, this was... Um... Now, we listened to Dr. Um, the, uh, the nurse from... Um, the, uh, was it Richard Hirschman? Cam no, uh, Campbell. Oh, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Okay. Campbell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we first were alerted to these clocks because he had morticians coming on his show. He's, he's out of... Uh, the UK. UK. Yeah. yeah. So he had uh, morticians out of New Zealand, then out of uh, Australia, then out of the UK, and finally another one out of the United States. And all of them were finding these blood clots. Well, they call them clots. They're really more like they're... They're long, stringy, white, elastic structures that do not dissolve in water, do not, you can be easily handled, can I'm be washed calam under. Calamari, he, he calls described them. them. Yeah, he's been seeing. And they take the form of not just veins, but the arteries, which is very unusual. Usually we find clots in a, uh, in a, vein. The, in a vein. And they're blood clots, and they're like gelatinous. They fall apart they, right. you know, when you take them out. And these, when you look at the pictures of them, and there's a couple of videos in here, uh, one with Dr. Campbell, I believe. Let mm -hmm. me look at that. Uh, yeah, one with Dr. Campbell, and another one with uh, uh, supplied by Peak Prosperity. And both of them talk about this. And they actually have samples, vials of the samples of this. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're um, strange fibrous materials combining. And basically what they do is they fill up the entire artery and take the entire shape of the artery and all of its little uh, uh, side yeah. bits. And, and there were some uh, articles that's in the mainstream that were talking about, well, these only happened after death. That's been totally... Uh, debunked. Disc, uh, debunked. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, yeah. There's a fellow by the name Richard Hirschman who is a, no relation, <laughs> a board certified embalmer and funeral director, and he said the unnatural unnatural blood clot combinations started to appear about six months after the vaccine rollout, which makes sense to him as he can't imagine something like that happening overnight. Yeah. And he said uh, he's seeing these in over 70% of the bodies he's been embalming. Remember that the World Health Association and the FDA is now recommending uh, hospitals Cream. pushing cremation. To get rid of the body. Maybe, you know, so it isn't know. autopsy and it isn't, and these things aren't found. And, and he it, says... Um, if this is caused by the vaccine, which my gut is telling me it is, and I can't prove that, but if this is caused by the vaccine, imagine the amount of people that would be dying in the future. So he's looking at years from now. Yeah, he says people room. can't live with this kind of substance floating around in their vessels. And it's amazing how many people are dying of heart attacks and strokes. If one of these small fibrous tissues gets into the brain, they're going to have a stroke. If it gets into your heart... It's going to lead to a heart attack. 
You don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but at the same time, people need to know this. If this, if the vaccine is causing this, we need to stop it. Whatever this stuff is, if we, if we can figure out what it is, then maybe we can figure out ways to dissolve it and maybe save the lives of people. Now, the, uh, I was listening to a couple of the embalmers on another podcast talking that they were reporting this mm-hmm. to the FDA. Right, right, right. FDA says, no, don't worry about it. It's nothing. has nothing it's to do rare. with it. Very rare. Very rare. And meanwhile, 70% of the bodies that are coming to this one embalmer. Yeah. Are... And most of them are saying 25 to up to 50%. Yeah. This one's saying 75%. 70%. Well, look at these videos. They're quite compelling. Mm-hmm. And then I put this last article in here by PolitiFact. It's, you know, which no is supposed clear, to be the fact, the fact checkers. Yeah, no clear evidence that COVID-19 vaccines are responsible for the strange blood cop. And very, very rare is what they're saying. Yeah, well, first of all, it's not rare. And second of all, it's uh, highly coincidental if it's not involved. But who knows? Anyway, the point is, if you do a search in Google, you find a bunch of articles saying it's absolutely safe, no side effects, no problems. And uh, here we have this incredibly scholarly paper that evaluated hundreds of articles and tests and trials and written by very expert people. And and they're finding a lot of things. So, And I mean, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who are having adverse effects, yep. they, they know. And the article talked a lot about, um, also about neurological complications. And the very first adverse effects that we were hearing about, be- before the even before the the uh, myocarditis, was the young young people who suddenly were in wheelchairs, who had been very athletic, and suddenly their entire bodies had failed. And, yeah. they, that and was, you can imagine these clots are in them. You, I don't know. Well, no, I'm talking about <clears throat> the uh, having taken the vaccine and. Yeah, well, this and then finding this, yourself in a wheelchair. Right? Yeah, well, if if your body is being clotted up, well, yeah, you you're see not how, getting enough blood, you're not getting yeah, oxygen, you're yeah. not. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, this is very disturbing. You know, read this material yourselves. Look at the videos. Also, look at the stuff that the PolitiFact is putting out and the retractions by the FDA. Look at all that stuff and make up your own mind on this stuff. Yeah, uh, these very, days you never know what's uh, what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's the show. <laughs> I'm very disturbed about all this. Uh, we're thankful, of course, that uh, we're, we're fine yeah, and, we're, and we're doing and, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's a it's a beautiful day. It's good to be knowledgeable. Yeah. It's good to have information. So you thank can... good for goodness for the internet right now because uh, this stuff is coming out, and a lot of important doctors are, uh, you know, people that we trust have been talking about this for a couple of years, Mm -hmm. but now it seems to be coming out more and more in the mainstream when a peer-reviewed paper comes out and then later on retracted by just two people when there's 300 different PubMed publications that are cited in this. So you know it's good information. Uh, You know, it's like, it's it's a crazy world we live in. And, uh, but... But we have we options have, to make good choices. And yeah, to, you have to make up your own choices. Uh, be kind. And, and uh, I think the medical community right now is trying to search themselves uh, and figure out how are they going to go from here because this puts a lot of light and bad information out of what else is going on. I mean, all the good stuff that doctors do mm. is now under question too, and we certainly don't want that. No, I mean, they're important well, plus, parts of the community. And, so many people were threatened. Their their livelihood was threatened. Yeah. Their, they were fired from their jobs, things, because they didn't follow the party line. And it's, it's yeah, very and the fact, important. We and, have to have choices. We have to be have control yeah, over our body. And that last part, that uh, the recommendations by our community leaders were... Uh, you know, by isolating and by masking and mm-hmm. by not going to school, mm-hmm. all these things made everything worse. Well, and, and the, the, yeah, the harm that was done to the children. Uh, there's so many, the ripple effect of this is going to go on for years. And yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult. Yeah. So again, make up your own minds on this. Uh, check it out. And uh, I hope uh, this is a help and uh, not a hindrance to you. I don't know what else to say about this. I'm 
dumbfounded. I mean, I, I read it before and now just going through it again and again, it's just uh, blows my mind. This is like a, a thing from the uh, 1940s where- You know, you know and, and <clears throat> at the very, very beginning, a person could be forgiven for thinking that this was going to be okay because of the information they were given. But as more information has come out, it's, you know, people are getting braver about getting back to the scientific method and the proper care of their patients. And so I'm hopeful that, that this will, uh, that will turn the corner, but I'm, I'm sad for the hundreds of thousands of people who died. Who are keep taking injections and still believing it too? So I mean, well, that's a it's a yeah. pers- as long as it's a personal choice, that's fine. Yeah. You know, you have to make up your own mind what yeah. you feel is right for you. Yeah, talk but, to your doctor. But if they're tra- if people are trying to take away that right to make up your own mind, to do your own search, to talk to your own doctor, then that's that's a well, it's unconstitutional. It's and it's a a, a terrible violation of the Nuremberg. <laughs> Accords and everything else. So it's important that we maintain our ability to. This is the land of the free, and you know we yeah. want to keep it that way. That's and right. It seems like right now it doesn't feel that good. So uh, let's go on. Maybe we got some better news next week. Uh, <laughs> dig out some positive stuff if we can. <laughs> but uh, right now, um, I'm still digesting this stuff, and I hope you're uh, feeling better. And uh, I hope everyone. Well, it's better going. to know than not to yeah. know. Anyway, we'll see you next time. Be well. Bye-bye now.